Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Mehdi Rahimi. I'm an endodontist that practices out of three different locations in Sydney, Chatswood, Parramatta and Double Bay. It's an honour to be giving a presentation today in this format um, to the divisions and study groups. Uh, the topic of my presentation is during this period of COVID-19, uh, what am I doing at the practice? Um, obviously following level three restrictions means that endodontists would be seeing true emergency cases. So I wanted to cover what I'm doing um, during this uh, uncertain and rather difficult period for everybody. And in terms of recommended reading, I found this article here quite useful. It was just recently published in February um, and it covers the different modes of transmission, uh, gives you a better understanding. But even more important than that particular paper is I encourage everyone to go to the Australian Dental Association website. Okay, so we're going to go into the nitty gritty of what I see every day and um, following level three restrictions. Very important that we triage those patients because there is something called emergency and within the word emergency, there's urgency. And what I mean by that is if the patient really has an urgent condition, that, is basically, that basically means the patient has uh, reduced quality of life, they can't sleep at night, they are unable to cope with the pain from this particular emergency. And it's very different to an everyday emergency that a patient might think they're in an emergency situation, but once we sieve them out over the phone or triage them, we realize they're not a uh, true emergency. So my staff are quite well trained at asking the appropriate questions to find out, is it an urgent case? or is it actually just an emergency where the patient wants to get the treatment done and have the crown cemented or something like that, which is not a true emergency. So the painful cases that I see are either cases where the pulp is undergoing necrosis, this is irreversible pulpitis cases, I might see symptomatic or acute apical periodontitis cases, and I might also see the painful swellings, acute apical abscesses, and even the cellulitis cases. And we also will see emergency cases uh, if a trauma occurs, crown, crown, root fractures, root fractures, which I cover in a different topic. Um, this paper came, um, caught my attention. Uh, an interesting paper, but nothing we don't already know. Um, when you debride the root canal after the diagnosis, that's what you should be doing. And that's where the pain reduces you know, very quickly. But if you leave the patient on analgesic, and it's a vital case undergoing necrosis, it will take a little longer, but the patient will eventually end up with full necrosis and no pain. And the paper points out, quite interestingly, that it's less likely that those cases where they had a vital case become necrotic end up in a um, true um, cellulitis or true emergency, whereas cases where you see where they're acute apical periodontitis or symptomatic apical periodontitis with a lesion, they're more likely to become a flare-up situation. So it doesn't mean that cases that are vital don't become flare-ups, but just sort of gives you a bit of a timeline uh, when you're looking at these cases. Very important is isolation. I just want to touch on isolation. Um, what I do in my practice um, these days and all the time is I aim for single tooth isolation. So it doesn't matter whether you, you know, the way you've been taught, some people use wings, some people use uh, wingless clamps, some people have the frame on top, some people have the frame underneath. That's all a personal preference. Um, one thing I found useful was the size one or two premolar clamp because not all teeth in the posterior region specifically are rhomboidal or rectangular in, in shape. So having this size one or two premolar clamp fits around the gingival margin uh, and you can isolate better. And even if it um, sort of catches the gingiva, it's usually not a problem. Um, I would do this differently these days, but often you need to plan for a long-term temporary restoration that lasts. So therefore you need to do a split dam technique. So you would isolate by clamping the posterior tooth and you would have what we call a split dam, which is jo holes joining together like here. But I guess I wouldn't want any pink. I want to cover this area with caulking agent or have more plastic um, by having single individual holes. Um, I have seen a number of patients, um, particularly cancer patients on really strong um, IV bisphosphonates, um, these are non-prolia um, um, bisphosphonates, which like Zometa, IV Zometa. So with those cases that I've seen, I would even do a single tooth isolation and clamp, you know, use the right clamp. Again, the size one premolar clamp often is good. And I might use something like GIC or composite to hold the clamp down. 
and that would give me appropriate single tooth isolation. So a lot of cases, if you've got a, a tooth with less structure, you may have to, if you decide to treat it and not extract it, you may have to clamp um, and a still single tooth isolation is possible. So this is the usual way I do a split dam. I join holes together and uh, I might have a, a separate hole for the um, clamp, the, you know, the, the rubber dam clamp. But these days I would keep these not joined and separate holes as well. Because again, I'm trying to increase the plastic and reduce um, the chances for leakage around there. And the caulking agent of choice for me these days is Opal Dam. Again, no best interest, but any liquid dam which you zap with a curing light and it sets, and I found Opal Dam to be the most uh, predictable, um, is less messy. So that's what I use to cover all the gap if I do a split dam technique. Oral Seal is another option, which is quicker to use. Um, however, the problem with Oral Seal, it can go everywhere, it can go on the gum, and sometimes you can't tell that it's washed away or suctioned away. And that's another potential problem with COVID-19. And, um, you know, I guess we're trying to minimize the chances and keep, the, uh, keep everything as sterile as possible. Um, so with Opal Dam, um, this is what we, we do here again. Um, so we zap it and it actually peels off really easily afterwards. Now another thing I do is, so they sit in the chair and the first thing I do is ask them to do the peroxyl rinse. So I use Colgate peroxyl, but you can get it from Johnson & Johnson as well or get it from the pharmacy at 3% diluted to 1%. But the 1% um, hydrogen peroxide has been heavily researched uh, and I get them to rinse for 30 seconds and discard. So um, the COVID virus or any viral viruses are very sensitive to oxidation. So that's why the peroxide, um, hydrogen peroxide is effective. I also pick up a cotton pallet, <clears throat> moisten it up with a bit of peroxyl and wipe the tooth surface before entering. So that's after rubber dam isolation. I use a red band handpiece because there's less um, aerosol produ uh, production. Um, I also would recommend less use of ultrasonics um, if you have to use ultrasonics. So um, that's what I've been doing in the practice. Now, very important point here. I'm not going to comment on the level of difficulty of the case or the dentist's ability. Some would have more experience. They can tackle more difficult cases. Obviously, during these times, you've got a bit more time, hopefully, because you're only seeing true emergencies, to plan your day out, give yourself more time in case you're um, encountering a more challenging case. If you do get challenging cases, obviously, some local endodontists are still possibly open, or you could at least get advice from them and um, you know, give them a call or contact them. Um, what I want to discuss is the importance of removal of all the existing restoration, especially during these times. And this paper, time in, time out, has been um, uh, uh, quoted by many endodontists. Um, Professor Paul Abbott, you know, they did a uh, research on about 245 teeth, and they looked at those teeth prior to removal of restoration and following removal of restoration. And they, what they found is two to three-fold more cracks and caries and up to about 80% marginal breakdown once you remove the restoration. So it behooves you to remove the restoration, assess the tooth properly prior to you know, um, temporizing it well. So apart from a long-term temporary, which I'll discuss very shortly, removal of all the restorations, um, what I recommend. Um, a lot of times you get a case like this and the dentist says, please keep the crown. Well, I take a bite wing and I see a questionable area there. And sure enough, once you look at the, you know, once you have a look at that tooth, there's plenty of caries underneath that. So you don't want to go through crowns. You want to remove all crowns and go by the basic principles properly, especially during this period, because you don't know when you might see this patient again. And just last week, I had a dentist uh, leave the tooth open to drain because it wouldn't settle. That's exactly the opposite of what you should be doing. Um, so you know that bacteria is in saliva, you know that a lot of the bacteria that might be more resistant to endodontic treatment like Enterococcus faecalis come from the enteric tract or the gut. So therefore, if you leave the tooth open to drain so it settles, it's never going to settle. So in a lot of those cases, what you need to do is clean it well and seal it well, and that's what we recommend. That brings me on to the point, single, versus, single visit. Um, um, obviously, endodontists with select cases may do single visit treatment, but during these periods, um, I would not recommend a dentist to be performing single visit treatment because a lot of people ask me about that. You should really be doing a long-term temporary because it's a lot more difficult to get back into the tooth. And with the painful cases, you don't know 
if the tooth is going to settle and to get back in and you've got gutta perca that you've got to remove is a lot more difficult. So I don't recommend single visit here at all. The medicaments of choice, um, obviously we do have a few options, especially if you're from Australasia, you've got the odonto pastes and the leather mix, which are the paste or steroid, uh, steroid pastes, and we've got the calcium hydroxide. I would highly recommend if you got to length and there was no vital tissue, you should be using the most effective antibacterial, the long-term dressing that lasts the longest and sort of has been proven to be the most effective antibacterial, which is calcium hydroxide. I like one of these, you know, this is from UltraCal, I'm not again advocating, I um, have no invested interest, but I do like those Navi tips because you can measure where you are, you can go a millimeter short and carefully and slowly inject the calcium hydroxide into the canal and you can actually then do a post-op check film to see where, you know, that the calcium hydroxide and the seal's done well. I also like them because they're radio-opaque, some of the calcium hydroxides might be radiolucent. The only time I recommend a steroid paste is if there is vital tissue that for whatever, whatever reason, the level of difficulty of the case wasn't assessed or was a more difficult case, you couldn't get down calcification or, or curvatures and there was bleeding pulp, I would then spin some paste, which is a steroid paste into the canal. Hopefully that reduces post-op pain for that patient. Just uh, the studies are showing that if you do a popotomy in cases when you know the case is difficult or you normally wouldn't manage that case, removing most of the um, axons are in the pulp chamber. So to do the pulpotomy, there's less pain than a pulpectomy, which is partial. So plenty of studies on that. These are older literature, well known that if you shred or you don't remove all the inflamed pulp, patient would end up with more pain. But I caution you that you need to either do it well, if you're going to do a pulpotomy, or you don't do it at all. So you need to have bleeding pulp, and that's a clinical assessment. If it's a necrotic pulp, you're not, you're not going to get any, um, you have to get to length, you've got to get to the apical zone and even establish patency to be able to clean out the most infected part of the root canal, which is the apical third. So in the cases where you've got bleeding pulp, you can do a cervical pulpotomy, and that has less, you know, this is, a, this is a pretty old review article which looks at all the studies, but you can see that post-op pain compared to pre-op pain was a lot less when you did a pulpotomy. Now, most important part of this lecture really is the temporization phase. So you're not going to see these patients for quite a long time because they most likely won't be in pain after your treatment because you've debrided well. How do you temporize the tooth? The recommended temporization is cavit and GIC. Cavit over the canal orify because it can be ultrasonicated out and is a lot softer. And then GIC, which is a little bit more wear resistant in the surface, the last two millimeters or so of the tooth. And if you want to use a cotton palette, which I don't recommend, don't use a really large cotton palette um, because that's more likely, there's more potential avenue for leakage. You want to use a minimal cotton palette and put it over each RFI. And that, that way, you know, you can seal the tooth uh, a lot better. So again, double seal is very important. And here's an example of uh, Dr. Mark Johnson's. He works with me as one of my colleagues in Sydney. He also works in Melbourne. So again, the tooth wouldn't, wouldn't settle. He did a split dam, as you can see. He removed, it behooves you to remove all the restoration, clean out the caries and the marginal breakdown. Remember that sometimes you can't see that until you remove the entire restoration, the caries and the cracks and even marginal breakdown. Sometimes you might go through the tooth, you know, in the middle, and if there's a crown, you can't tell if your core has loosened. So that's why you remove everything, you have a good look, you find the canals, and when you deem the tooth restorable, you put a band on it, and then you put your GIC through, and then you do your single tooth isolation. So in terms of um, choosing and how to do a band, well, the, these days I'm using an interproximal stripper, so it's less likely to uh, you know, cut the tooth adjacent, and I choose the best fitting band, and I make sure it fits well, and the patient's able to clean around it, so it fits well, there's less soft deposit trap if it fits well, and obviously you give appropriate oral hygiene instructions. And this is what I work through, single tooth isolation after I've stripped the tooth away and put the band on. So I go back in and you can see everything and you can keep a very you know, sterile condition here. And you can even bathe the root canal and the, and, and the floor with a hypochloride during the treatment. If uh, the patient's walking away and they're like, well, I don't like this band, it doesn't look right. You can put a couple of slots and some flowable composite so you can mask, you know, make it more aesthetic. It shouldn't be an issue. 
always remember to take a post temporization check film. I've learned this from the early days that sometimes, you know, you don't know if you, for example, separated the instrument. You always do a check film in case somebody else goes into tooth after you and separates the instrument. Same thing goes with long term temporary provisionalization. You want to make sure your temporary is sitting right. You want to make sure there's no um, gaps around your temporary or, you know, it's, it's sealing well. Now, in terms of what material apart from band, well, uh, Sasalak Paktitai from Melbourne did, did an interesting study where they used GIC domes. In, under my hands, GIC domes seem to frac fracture off more quickly, um, but this paper showed that they may be a relatively good long-term um, sort of temporary co compared to the stainless steel bands, but I still would go with stainless steel bands. The other you know, material that you might consider is a full composite overlay. So you reduce all the cusps and you overlay with a flat occlusal plane composite. And this is a 20 month recall. You might ask why? Um, the reason is because there was probably a crack here or these teeth didn't have a very good long-term prognosis. So sometimes we do temporize teeth like that and leave them to see, you know, what happens. Do they go downhill or do they still, you know, remain asymptomatic without a pocket? So you might, you know, then consider more expensive options. So again, a flat occlusal plane composite is a very good you know, temporary, of course, underneath that you need cavit and GIC over the pulp chamber. How about if you incise and drain? And I know that when you, you can't help it when you see a flux, fluxion swelling, I have a bias towards putting around about a centimeter long um, incision in the gum. It needs to be large enough to drain and get rid of the pus. Um, and I was taught back at undergrad, never let the sun set on undrained pus. And uh, that was taught, you know, inbuilt for me. So whenever I saw fluxion swelling, I'd, I'd drain it. But I'd like to remind you that, you know, yes, you see a fluxion swelling and yes, you can drain it. It's more important to debride. You'd never ever prescribe antibiotics and let the patient go. go. You either extract the tooth or get in and debride the canals. That is the number one most important thing to do. Drainage is a secondary thing. So if, again, it's not a must and you don't have to do it. And I show you a paper just to prove the point where they had the mock team, the mock, you know, group where they actually, the patient thought they're getting an incision and drainage, but they actually put a scalpel handle and they pretended like they're doing an incision in the gum. And then they put a suture in the mucosal fold there instead of doing the actual incision and drainage. And what they found, and this is uh, where, you know, a little bit of um, what we know might not be quite true, patients that actually had the mock incision and drainage had less post-op pain than patients that had the true incision and drainage. So do it, but definitely do not do the incision and drainage in the cases where there's a cellulitis. You're not gonna find any pus when you, you know, put an incision in, you'll probably find blood. In these cases, there's no indication for an incision drainage. You should really re refer cases like this to the hospital. And more importantly, in, in cases where they've got a cellulitis, where they may have fever, malaise, feeling unwell, um, you would be prescribing antibiotics. The antibiotic regime of choice is amoxicillin 500, three times a day. Um, unless they're allergic to amoxicillin, then, then you might give them clindamycin. And in some cases, you might also combine your antibiotics with metronidazole, slightly stronger. In the medically compromised patients that have localized swellings, I may, in some of those cases, uh, prescribe antibiotics. During these periods, I may also prescribe antibiotics and tell the patient, keep it with you, especially if they came in with a swelling. And if you don't take it, unless things don't settle and gets worse, I also warn them to go to the hospital if things get worse. How about over-the-counter medications such as um, you know, anti-inflammatories? Uh, there are different ones on the market, and in particular, the Neuromore one, which has a higher concent you know, sort of, it's 200 milligram ibuprofen as opposed to Maxi which was 150 is proven to be effective against pain measures. Um, however, there is a problem. The FDA has recommended no use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories um, because obviously, similar to a uncontrolled asthmatic patient, these patients that have COVID-19, they may ha have an acute respiratory phase and we can't tell, sometimes they come in and maybe a few days later they develop the symptoms and obviously taking anti-inflammatories increases do those pro-inflammatory um, cytokines such as leukotrienes and that means that they can have a more acute episode or reaction from the problem they have. 
So I, I don't recommend them. So we do usually prescribe a stronger form, ibuprofen 600-800, which is more effective if patients have severe pain. But I recommend the panidine fort version. So this is also combined with dexamethasone because dexamethasone is, a non is not a non-steroidal, it's a steroidal, and it doesn't have the same problem with asthmatic or, or COVID patients. So the script that I write, there's some evidence in the literature, especially in the oral surgery literature where they inject dexamethasone, um, and also in the cancer, you know, patients that have cancer and pain, they prescribe four milligram dexamethasone and it's four tablets twice a day. So this is my script that I normally write for a patient with a swelling and um, especially if they're medical compromised or they may have cellulitis, I write after draining the tooth, of course doing the treatment, amoxyl, you know, three times a day for about a week and I tell them to take it in case they need it or things get worse and they swell up further. Um, or and panadine fort, and this is maximum eight per uh, 24 hours, and I also prescribe dexamethasone. Now, people talk about dexamethasone, whether it's legal to prescribe. Pharmacists might call you just to check what we're prescribing here, but if you prescribe a low number and dosage over a short period, you won't get the body becoming lazy and you won't get um, problems such as the Addisonian crisis. So occlusal reduction is very important for two reasons. One, to reduce post-op pain for the patient. Second, you can get more light. You can see things better apart from stripping away the tooth. Occlusal reduction is highly recommended, especially in the severe pre-op pain cases with no lesion and tenderness to percussion, it was found to be effective. And a meta-analysis of you know, a recent one shows that day three onwards, occlusal reduction is actually significantly effective. And why is that? Because in the first few days, you might have normal inflammatory pain. Any patient would have some form of pain, but day three onwards, that pain should, the inflammation should have reduced. So it's kind of like having a bruise on your body and you keep punching that area of the bruise. So if the tooth is in occlusion, it's more likely that they'll have ongoing pain. Whereas if you reduce it, you know, there's less likelihood. And then finally, Importance of guidelines, I recommend everybody, you know, downloads from this website here, the iadtdentaltrauma.org, the guidelines, because sometimes when you see a trauma case, you don't have enough time to go read the books or find out what to do. And for example, in this case, you know, you might have a few hours before you can get a good predictable, you know, outcome with this extrusive luxation if you place the tooth back in position. And you might have, you know, 25, 30, 40 minutes before the AVOLS tooth you know, has a lesser outcome. The ligament is uh, more likely between 45 minutes to an hour to die off. So again, you need to act quickly. This is why I highly recommend everybody on their mobile app, you know, even patients download this um, tooth sauce um, recommended um, application and they can look up and they can see, and this is the example for patients, you know, for example, they place the tooth back in within 20 minutes and they hold the tooth in the right position. Even if there's blood, you place it in. So um, there's a lot of good material and you can have it on your phone, which is the quickest way, or at least print out the guidelines from the, from the um, website and, you know, laminate and keep them somewhere safe. And again, just to show dentists who follow guidelines, it doesn't mean that every single dentist gets an outcome because every trauma is different, but if they conform to that guideline, there's a definite more significant, um, you know, less comp complication rate and a much better uh, success rate. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please email me on mediagentleindodontics.com.au. I'm happy to answer any questions or, or contact me via Facebook, um, private message me if you have any questions regarding this lecture.